So this is the Sprint review for Sprints 42 and 43. Uh, Kate is on uh, vacation for two weeks, so I'm going to be um, leading us along through the Sprint demos. Uh, my name is Holly Misselbauer, and I work at Cornell University. And I'm working, uh, one of my roles on Folio is as product owner for Fees and Fines. So welcome, everyone. Uh, so these are the, uh, whoops, these are the teams um, that we have uh, working on Folio. And I am aware of a couple of new people. Um, I am aware that we have a new product owner, Sean. Uh, Thomas, and uh, I believe he is connected. Um, I am indeed. Thanks. Yeah, there he is. So welcome. Welcome, Sean. We're happy to have you. Um, he works for EBSCO, and he's a full-time um, product owner. So welcome. Uh, we also have a new halftime developer from, uh, we, uh, yeah, we got we to gotta update this slide to add Sean to this. We also have a, a part-time uh, developer who has joined the um, UNOM team, uh, Lewis, um, and he's already uh, contributed um, some code uh, to the project. So uh, I don't think he's on the call, but welcome, Lewis. And um, does anybody know of anyone else who's new? Hey, Holly, this is Kalila. Hi. We have a new development team, Folly Jet, that just joined um, Folio community. Oh, great. Uh, hi, Holly. We also have uh, Nasib Nassar as a new product owner for the uh, reporting SIC. Oh, that's right. Hi, hi Holly. Hi. We have another new developer on the EBSCO team, Kruthi Rupala. Hey, this is Nasib. Um, I've heard good things about this folio project. <laughs> I'm so happy to hear that. That's great. Okay, so it looks like we've got lots of new people. That's wonderful. Welcome, everyone. It's great to have you. We'll have to get your names added to the uh, to the appropriate slides here if you're not already. Um, so welcome, everyone. As you can see, there are a lot of people working on this project and uh, we're producing a lot of good stuff. Okay. Oh yeah, there's the, there's the team. And we're going to get to see a demo today, which is great. So the highlights, uh, as you know, we always show the highlights from the, um, the last two sprints. And um, the ones that are in red are the ones that did not get updated. Uh, so uh, they should look suspiciously familiar uh, because they're probably from the last sprint. Uh, but if you want to get a, a get a better look, you can look at the sprint slides. Um, we'll make them available after the sprint with the recording, the sprint review, excuse me. And so each team has um, provided information about what they have uh, been working on um, in the, the last two sprints. And so you can get a nice, nice overview of what's been happening. Um, but the important part is we want to see the demos. Uh, so we're going to start with the core team. Um, Aditya, are you are you available? Hi, Holly. Yeah. Hi. Okay. So I am going to stop sharing, mm -hmm. and you can go ahead and take over. Sure. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Right. So, yeah. First one I would like to show is in the inventory app. It's the small thing. Um, so when you try to add, add an item. So previously, um, we had a uh, different placeholders here. Now we have select location and uh, for the permanent and temporary location. And in the scenario where you create an item, uh, some um, 
So the permanent and temporary location, if you do not mention anything, previously we had it saying inherited from holdings. Um, that was kind of misleading because as you can see, the temporary location for the holdings um, could be a null value and saying inherited from holdings there was kind of mis misleading. So that's now been replaced by just um, dash sign. And uh, similar things have been added to the holdings as well. So on selecting a permanent location, but leaving the temporary location to just the default, you create a holdings record. And when you view the holdings, uh, oh yeah. So when you view the holdings, uh, as you can see here, the temporary is defaulting to dash. It doesn't say inherited from anywhere. So that's a small change that's been added. And the next one is, yeah. So in the request app, Uh, this is, I think, only on test. I think testing is down currently. Um, so, not sure if this is on snapshot yet. So, I think uh, that's it for me because uh, the other issue is currently only on testing. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, I can show it in a couple of minutes once testing is back. I think it's building right now because it's 11. It builds every hour. Okay, well, uh, we'll come back to you after we get through the other core team presenters, okay? Yes, sir. Okay, Kurt, you're up next. Hey there, can you hear me okay? Yep. All right, so uh, this is actually going to be a really short one. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and uh, talk you through it. Let's see here. Let's see. I guess do the right thing here. Let's see. Let's see if that works. Okay, so we'll share that. And hopefully, switch. Okay, so you should be seeing the uh, the users um, uh, list here through the Folio um, administration. So what we did was. Um, making the uh, login sensitive of whether or not a user is listed as. Um, their status is active or inactive. Previously, that had primarily affected uh, circulation, um, but we've made the login modules also um, sensitive to these settings. So what we'll do is we'll just take a look at this user here. Uh, we're gonna change their status to inactive, update that user, and uh, we'll go ahead and attempt to log in as that user now. And uh, the user gets informed that uh, they need to be active uh, in order to um, to log in. So you know, assuming they've uh, talked to their uh, administrator and got themselves uh, reactivated. Oh, well, if I can type in the right administrator <laughs> password here, uh, we can go back to that user. go modify the user we're going to change it back to active and if all goes well they have their login rights restored and uh, that's all they'll see great okay Next up, we have Mark Deutsch. Hey there. Hi, Mark. Oops. Okie doke. I'm sharing. And I'm going to show two things. Uh, the first is a bit of a continuation for the um, for the request cancellation work that I did in the last sprint. So previously we were just pulling the reasons 
for why you would cancel a request um, from a hard coded list. And now we have an actual um, uh, UI where we can edit those request cancellation reasons. So we would just go into circulation and check the, the reasons. And by default, our backend boxes ship with four reasons. Um, and so we have naturally the, the title of the reason uh, and these two description fields. So the idea is that um, perhaps we have cancellation reasons that, uh, that we don't wanna show externally to the patrons. Um, perhaps we have a cancellation reason that says, cancel this, uh, uh, this request because someone else who's more important has <laughs> requested uh, this book. Um, so we might not wanna show that to the less important patron. Yeah. Um, so simple sort of setup here. We've seen this, this all before, but uh, um, let's say we have a request cancellation for, um, whoops, more important user requested. Uh, leave it delightfully ambiguous. And now we can go into requests. And as before, we can just open up any request and uh, cancel request and the reasons are available over here. So we see the title over here, but in the future, whenever we're um, sending these notifications out to our patrons, we'll be using that, uh, that public description field. So now we have the request status as closed and canceled. And eventually we'll be showing um, why, the, like the request reason um, and any description in this request detail pane as well. So that's that for that feature. Um, and the next one deals with service points. So this is the first set of uh, work on service points that blocked you know, the rest of the, the stories. So just as, as a bit of a primer for anyone who hasn't um, been familiarized with the concept, uh, eventually we're gonna have um, users who log into the Folio system and let's say they're uh, checking in or checking out books, uh, like operating the check-in and check-out modules we want to be able to record where they're checking and checking out those books from, um, which physical location. Uh, so we have to assign these uh, service point desks or circulation desks to that user um, and where they're allowed to work from. So when we're assigning this kind of stuff, we're in the user's uh, module and we can just select any given user. And we have this new service points accordion here. And once we expand it, um, we see we already have a bit of information here because uh, Wayne set up the boxes to auto populate this a bit for us. Um, but uh, we can go, in, go ahead and edit this. And over here we see that we've got our two service points down here um, and we can add, remove them. and uh, we can select a service point preference for this user. So the service point preference is what service point will be automatically selected when that user logs into Folio. Um, if we don't want a service point to be automatically selected, then we can just mark that as none and go ahead and update that user. And we see that we've got this set up now. Um, this works similarly to permissions. So when we create a user, we are not allowed to, uh, to set their permissions immediately. So similarly, we can't set their service points just because of the way the backend is organized. Um, 
but all right, that's all we need to set. No, we need a password. But after we've created the new user, we see that they have no service points and we can edit them just as before. And there we are. Um, I think that's it for, for this demo. Um, thanks a lot. Can I ask a question? Definitely. What What is the reason for assigning the CERC, the CERC desk to the user? So this is a, somebody who works at the library and they're authorized. When they're logged in, they're associated with this CERC desk, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. So if, if uh, everything that gets checked out is associated with this CERC desk, that if it gets returned someplace else, it would go into routing? Right. Yeah. Like, uh, I think there's smarter people than I can, can fill in any gaps, but I think the idea is that, um, if you're checking something in at a particular, uh, circ desk and let's say, uh, there's a request at, you know, the other end of, of mm -hmm. university or in a campus, you know, exactly wh uh, where that is, where that item is and like what, how that, uh, the item should be transported to the new right. place. Okay. And it's, it's not, you don't attach users to the service desk. You attach the service desk to the user. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. Thanks. Okay. Um, our next presenter is Mark Stacy. Hello. Can you hear me? All right. Um, sure. Can you see my uh, my my front of the folio app? Yep. All right. Um, so the issue that I've been working on is checkout timeout, um, and that is if there's any inactivity in the checkout timeout, um, and uh, that time has elapsed, that the actual session will clear. So first I wanna show you in the settings um, under circulation, uh, there is um, the setting in here for automatic end checkout session after period of inactivity. You can turn this off if you don't want uh, your sessions ever to clear, you can turn it off or you can turn it on. And I've set it to one minute um, so that we don't have to sit around long here in this uh, demo, um, but you can change this to any, uh, number any timeout period that you want to uh, to set um, the other thing is is once this is set you can go into checkout um, you can uh, pick a faculty member sure and uh, hopefully that's still in there oh, shoot of course it's hard to check there <laughs> uh, I tested it right before and I didn't check it back out uh, there it is. Let's check back out. Okay. So we're coming back in here um, and we're going to check out the, the Bridget Jones uh, baby. So at this point, uh, if I stop moving and I don't want to touch my mouse or do anything, um, and I have changed action an actual minute to 15 seconds. So in about uh, the next 10 seconds, this session should end and disappear, and it just disappeared. Um, so that was really, really quick. It was one minute, but then I also changed the time down to 15 seconds. So every minute equals 15 seconds, so we didn't have to sit and wait. Um, and uh, it clears the session. So, so if somebody left the, uh, the desk and needed uh, and didn't end the session, it would automatically end the session based on what you said in your uh, settings right here. So, and that is all I have. Any questions? Okay. Any questions? 
Okay, we'll move on to Mikkel and then go back to Aditya. Uh, hi, Polly. Hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? How are, how are you guys? Pretty good. Um, let me just try to share my screen here. Um, all right, can you, uh, can you see it here? Yep. So um, it will be pretty quick to, I, I have two different features to show you. Um, the first one is this new ability to uh, add tags to, to users. Um, so we, we added this uh, new helper, we call them helper apps uh, called tags. So I'll just show you how to, how to operate that. So, so the first thing we have to do here is go to settings and you will see this new uh, settings tab called tags and we, when you open it up, you can enable tags by clicking this little checkbox here. And when you uh, save it, the tags should be now enabled. So when we move to under users, um, let me just close this uh, and choose one of the users, you should be able to see this new little icon uh, called show tags. And of course, I should <laughs> close this before I uh, so, but anyway, when you when you click on it, you you will see this new uh, helper app uh, showed showed on the right side of the screen. It it works in a very similar fashion to Notes. Uh, you can toggle be, between those two helper apps now, um, uh, and one of them will be always active. Um, and let me maybe show you how this works. So we can start adding some text here to to the given user. Also, if, when we switch to another user, the, the tags uh, app will stay open and we can keep tagging another, another user here too. Um, this is still a work in progress. We are currently working on improving this uh, input here. It will be a, a multi-select input. I believe that uh, John Coburn is working on that. So hopefully during the next demo, this will be a little bit more exciting and you will be able to search um, and see existing tags in the system when, when you, when you um, tag the given user. Uh, so this is this, is this first feature. Um, another, another thing I was working on uh, recently is uh, the ability to add multiple uh, locations to the given service points. So again, when we move here to settings under organization, we, we can see the service points. And this we had this before. Um, when we open one of those service points here, uh, you can see that down below, just this, uh, down below we have now the ability to choose multiple locations and assign them to the given service point. Uh, this works in a very similar fashion to what we do with uh, permissions and permission sets. Um, when we create a permission set, we, we are able to add multiple permissions. Um, the functionality here is very, very similar. Um, and that's, that's it for me. I'm not sure if you have any questions. Any questions? I have one actually, Mikhail. Can you uh, just give me an example of sure. a use case for, for the tags that you're adding? Uh, sure. So the main idea here from what I've heard is uh, we want to use them to quickly search, um, search and sort um, different users by, by tags. Uh, we, we, this is just the beginning, but, but I think that the idea here is to also introduce tags to other entities um, like inventory and items, you know, and other, other areas in the system. Um, that's all I know so far, but I'm sure there are other, uh, other ideas behind it. Okay. So it's, it's, primarily like a, a local use um, item as opposed to something that would be you know, deeper in the data model? Yeah, um, again, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure about the big picture here. I, from what I've heard is that the main, um, main idea behind it is to, to be able to quickly search, for example, for a group of, of users who share the same, um, same characteristics, uh, but yes, maybe for reporting also in the future. I'm not sure if somebody else here could. Uh, I can't speak it. about the data model, but I can say that from a user experience point of view, um, the text in an alphabet is meant to serve as a general purpose way to 
tech stuff that you need to find again, like Mikhail mentions. So it could be um, a sort of um, temporary way to, to, you know, if you have some tasks you need to perform on certain records, for example, users, you can tag them with a, with a tag for yourself uh, or for your team. Uh, and it can also serve in other apps as a way to categorize things for your institution. Um, it's not meant to compete with the metadata that goes into inventory records, for example. Um, but for a time, it might be that uh, it is used to perform um, to sort of add information to records that might longer term fit better in custom fields in various records. So for, for types of information that, isn't a, that there isn't a field for in the system, uh, one might add a tag instead of hijacking a marked field. Uh, and long term, we want to support the ability of flexible record templates so that you could add, add the fields that you need to your folio records. Um, I don't know if that's helpful, Sean. It is. It is. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Philip. I, I also wanted to just, I, I forgot to add that, but uh, um, the work behind this on the back end is uh, quite complicated. And this was done by Heike and it's, uh, it's supposed to be, again, generic enough so we can assign those stacks to different, different, different entities in the system. And this will be a next, I believe, next step here um, after we finish up with the, with the users. Uh, so yeah, that, that's it. Okay, um, Aditya, you want to present now? If yeah, sure. Can. Yeah. You can see my screen. Uh, yep. Yeah. Right. Um, so the next one is in settings, uh, organization locations. So. I already made an entry here. So in the location details, so like an, as an admin uh, who is creating like the location records, um, he or she would want to have uh, like the location name suggestions whenever uh, he's like entering a new uh, name here, for example. So if I enter D, so the department is already there in my uh, details um, section, but this is across my all the folio installations like for example i have level four maps here which i have entered for the demo and i entered d here i can see department which is actually in another location but if he or she wants to reuse it um, there's a drop down that gives the suggestions of all the names which have been used in the previously um but another thing is if you delete detail and again to enter it doesn't show up only if it's there currently only then it will give the suggestion so that's one thing and yeah also previously uh, when you were editing uh, this record um, there was validation on the name value pair and for, like, for the usability purpose, if you save and close this, you had uh, the validation error showing up, but that's been removed now, so you can actually save and close it without any errors showing up. Also, if you enter this partially, it won't let you go through. You need to either enter it or either delete this row and or similarly for the value pair as well, name value pair. So that's for this feature. The next one is mostly backend work. Um, so now we can see the position in the request queue uh, for the request uh, for individual items. So for example, here, um, uh, Suppose for the girl, the girl on the train. 
currently there's only one request against it so its position in queue is one but if i go ahead and create a new one and So you can see the position in the queue is two. So the position is uh, the this number is based on the creation time of the request. So as you can see, based on the time and the date, that's how they get sorted. You can see the same uh, detail even on the request details info page here, as well as on the edit. And yeah, and that's it for me. Okay. Um, so I just sent in the chat, I sent the, a link to the slide that lists the presenters so that everybody can see uh, who is presenting. Uh, does anybody have any questions about what we've seen so far? Hi, it's Sean again. Uh, I have another question if, if you'll... Okay, uh, go right ahead. Uh, is Kurt still with us? Oh, yeah, I'm here. Kurt, I had a question about the, your uh, patron status change mm -hmm. um, work. That seems like something that would, um, that would naturally be a part of batch editing uh, user records. For example, if a, a whole class of graduating seniors leaves, um, you might want to change the status of that. I don't know if this is an effort that's been, uh, that's been underway already. Uh, it might be something that I'm going to start taking a look at, but I'm curious as to whether that's uh, functionality that you would see that could be a part of a, of a batch load, that that's inactive status or change from active to inactive is something that can happen uh, as a result of a batch load as well. Um, or batch edit. Yes, I, I really don't know. Um, um, I'd have to look at the, the status of our, of our batch um, loading thing, but you know, it's certainly, you know, the, the status is, is, is one of the fields in the user record. I don't see why it could not be uh, part of, uh, of a, uh, a batch update. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so we have a couple of additions. Um, we're going to have Charlotte first from the core team. She's stepping in for Niels. Hi, everyone. Let me share my screen. Um, I will give you a quick demo of uh, the work we have done on uh, UIN 93. And as you can see, it involves quite a suite of um, uh, Jira tickets here. And it's, uh, yeah, uh, Nils Eric Nelson has uh, been in the lead of the UI, but it also requires work from Mark Johnson, from uh, Wayne, from uh, Alphonse Zielen, from uh, Julian Ladish, and more people. Um, I put it in presenter mode here. Um, what we have implemented here is the possibility to link from the instance record in inventory, which is in the uh, format neutral format, to um, the original record um, if it's a record migrated into the system uh, as a mark record, or in near future it can also be a record in other formats than mark, bib frame in core, et cetera. And it, it also involves, uh, right now we have a loaded uh, test data, but um, yeah, um, the whole work around loading data into the Folio system. Some of you probably have seen this uh, conceptual diagram, but what we are doing here is the orange uh, arrays, uh, arrows. Um, so we have established the linking from the folio instance record to the generic BIP storage. Then let me show how it works. And I'm going into folio testing and I can find a title here. And we get this, the chess players 
uh, mating guide. Um, and then if you click on this button, the view source, then you get the mark source record in the uh, traditional uh, mark view, complete view of all the tag fields, the indicators, the subfields, etc. And when you click back again, then you get back to um, uh, the inventory. Then Nils, he provided me with some uh, screenshots this morning, just for you to get a better sense uh, about what's happening behind the scene. So uh, in the link in the page here, we have this, and I'm not a technician, so, but it probably uh, is uh, something all uh, developer colleagues, they understand. And um, this is what um, the request from the browser to the backend looks like. And finally, um, this is the response from the back end. Um, and right now we uh, store um, the uh, records as uh, Mark and Jason. Um, yeah, that's that. And uh, this is something we have been yeah, looking forward to implement for quite some time because now it's possible when you um, migrate your data into uh, the folio system, then you, you know your mark records, all the librarians, the catalogers, they know how the mark records are looking and now they can uh, review how, how is it looking in the uh, instant as a bibliographic record in the instance record and compare the two. That's all for me. Any questions for Charlotte? Uh, okay. So is that implemented? Uh -huh. Is that is that in the test? Uh, uh, it's in folio testing. It's not uh, yet in the folio um, snapshot uh, stable, um, but it uh, was merged yesterday. So oh, we are great. almost there. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Okay. So uh, Roman has uh, something he would like to show us next. Okay, um, uh, sharing now, you can see my screen? Yep. Okay, so uh, yeah, the issue number is SD Core 208, uh, moving to the new React Context API. Um, this is a React change, so that's our UI framework. Um, moving into the next major version, uh, we have to get ready in uh, kind of two major ways which is some of the functions that we use, and then also the context API, which we used. We previously used a, a beta uh, context API, and it, it changed in a significant way. Um, but it's not too complicated, uh, and, but it is uh, definitely different. Um, so I just went through the, uh, our, our code base and updated it where we, we used the old context API and uh, went ahead and added the new context API. So we used it for the stripes object, and we used it for the um, root object, and we use it in a couple of a handful of other places. Um, wherever you need to use it, it's easy to create your own file, which is basically just like this one. Just swap out your object with a um, uh, different name and it's kind of like a template. Um, so yeah, the changes were to uh, there were about fourteen PRs to different uh, repos. Um, and this issue also blocked another uh, issue, which I, I re referenced uh, over here on that React uh, page, which is changing our lifecycle hooks. The new lifecycle hooks um, can't use the this object. Um, they use the props. So since the new React context API uses props, uh, that gets us ready to use the new lifecycle hooks in our code base as well. Uh, and, and all of this is to get us to React 17 in the future when that does release so that we'll have better performance on the front end. And that's it. Thanks, Roman. Any questions for Roman? Okay, so next on the list we have stacks, but I'm not sure that anyone is actually here to present. Uh, 
Do we have anyone from Starks here? Yeah, we're here. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, so who's here from Stacks? Uh, this is Arvin Holly. Oh, okay. And, Thank and you. Tim and John are here. As oh, well. yeah. Oh, okay, great. Okay, so um, let me just share my screen. Uh, oh, you want that screen? This one. This is going to be really quick. Um, we have a couple of um, screens working on orders. Um, so when you create an order, it automatically takes the, um, the user here. Um, of course, you can change it if you want to. Um, for example, one, two, three, four, thing. Um, we're still um, under construction and doing the uh, edit page. Uh, right now, it's um, the date is invalid and it doesn't take the uh, created date. Um, um, a few screens on this one. We have uh, receive items, um, um, drop down. Uh, hold on. So again. These are all under construction, so uh, we also have a screen for receiving or received. I hope I don't confuse you guys with that one. Um, we have screens for um, add PO line, uh, drop downs are also there, some of it. Um, View is working as well. We don't have edit page. Um, um, that's it for orders and for the vendor. We finally figure out how to uh, display errors. So when you're trying to create a new one, and um, you for for example, you type something. And you accidentally um, add another one in here, it will automatically show you the required field. So even if it's closed, when you save it, it's not gonna uh, create one. It's gonna show you that the required fields that you need to fill out in here. Can you fill out that one? Um, yeah, that's, uh, I guess that's it for us, basically. Is there any questions? Hello? Any questions from anybody? It was a quick one, so. <laughs> <laughs> no okay. Question. Next up, we have front side. Cool. And if you want to introduce the people who are present uh, presenting, that would be great. Or person. So, Kalila, are you going to take this, or should I? Um. We have several folks presenting. So the first person that will present will be Soba regarding um, Boolean searching that we, we've implemented, followed by um, Sam, who will present uh, our pattern for searching within a list, uh, followed by uh, Jeffrey, uh, who will present about our work on uh, responsive pain uh, a responsive pain design on the detailed record. And then uh, last but not least, Taras, who will talk about his work on the date picker. Okay. So we're gonna kick off with Soba first. Okay, cool. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Sure. Um, let me just share my screen here real quick. Okay. Can you guys see my screen now? Yeah. Okay, so uh, if we go to eHoldings app, it 
uh, leverages EBSCO's resource management API to get its providers, packages, and titles. And um, EBSCO's RM API now, uh, now supports advanced search, which we have leveraged in our eHoldings app. So what we can do with advanced search is now we can conduct exact phrase searches, Boolean searches, or wildcard searches. I'll uh, provide examples for a few of them today. So with the exact phrase search, um, if we enclose the search string within double quotes, then it actually searches and provides us results of these words in the exact order. The first search takes a little bit, so bear with me for one second. There we go. So Harvard Business Review and all of these results will be in the exact order of the search string. And for Boolean searches, RM API now supports uh, three operators, which is the Boolean not, R, and and. So let's see a couple of examples of those. If we search for something like civil war and war between the states, then we would see results which have civil war and war between the states in all of the results that are returned. Sim similarly for the Boolean or, if we search for something like fashion or dress, we would see results which have fashion, dress, or both. And if we search for the Boolean not, like fashion and not dress, it would give us results containing only fashion but do not have dress in it. The Boolean operator has to be in uppercase. And it also supports wildcard search. Uh, for example, if we search for something like this with an asterisk, it provides all those results which have compute and something following it. It also supports um, general search, like we could use a combination of what we just saw, like dog or cat and show or parade, and then it would do a combination of either this or this and combine those results. Like we'll see something like the dog show or the cat show, etc. There we go. And the last one is we can also now conduct focused search, which is we can enclose search strings within parentheses and those will be interpreted first, followed by the ones that are outside of parentheses. So the results would be something like containing physical, mental, and illness um, as specified in the string. That's all I got. Okay. Okay. Thanks. All right. Next up will be Sam. Hello. Sorry. Um, sorry. Okay, sorry about that. Can you guys see my screen? See it. Okay. Yes. So uh, what I changed is the modal uh, for surging within a package right now. Um, and before for what it would do is if you didn't have just any any time you change something it would close automatically so it no longer does that uh, which is super cool and now um, you can search for um, just filters before you wouldn't be able to do that and um, you know update the badge and you can go in again and I added this uh, reset all button so that will just close immediately default everything back. Um, another thing that we changed was, um, and Taras actually did this, but he moved uh, all of this modal stuff to its own component so that it's more reusable. Um, I know later on we're going to use it for title, so that's going to be really helpful. Um, but, oh yeah, and we also, so you'll see that these buttons aren't enabled if there's no change that's been made. 
Um, and you can also search by hitting enter on the keyboard or just get rid of it by hitting escape. Um, what else do I need to talk about? Sorry for rushing. <laughs> um, oh yeah, and the search button and the badge that would display over here are in their own self-contained component now, um, which is also something Taras did. I don't know if you wanted to talk about that at all, Taras, but. Uh, yeah, so one of the, um, it's worth pointing out that this UI is something that is at the moment unique to eHoldings, but uh, because of the way that this component is implemented, we could, if, if there is a, the, the way this is, works is that there is the, the icon, um, Sam, can you select one of the packages and just hit search so it will show, um, yeah, just show the change. So you notice the, uh, the filter count um, beside the search icon, that, that together with the model is one component. So we have a um, pretty self-contained piece of functionality that is designed to filter results in place. So if this kind of functionality, um, if, so, if another project wants to use functionality, it would be easy for us to move this into a self-contained like um, Stripe's component um, that could be applied in other uh, in other applications, um, and um, the difference here is that so there there is a, um, a feature that exists today which allows to uh, filter down results, but it requires like navigating to a whole separate list. Uh, the idea here is that if you have a lot of results, where in this case we have 800 results, you can filter the, the list in place without having to leave the context that you're in. Um, and in, in that we have other pay, pay places where there's thousands and thousands of records. So it, this kind of uh, interface allows the user to drill down into exactly the kind of, uh, into, kind of uh, into the data they're looking for without having to change um, their inter like change the the context and lose track of where they are. So if there is an interest in, in having this in other in other applications, we could make this available as a common component. As a stripes component. That's everything. Yeah, but yes, this one was really short. That was just a cool thing that is now here that I wanted you to see. Uh, anybody right. have any questions? No. All right. All right. Great job, Sam and Taras. Uh, next up is Jeffrey. Hey y'all, get my screen shared, there we go. All right, so I wanna talk about uh, these record panes. Um, so we had uh, done, been doing a lot of iteration lately on kind of converging these closer to appeared in other uh, folio modules. Um, so we now have accordions uh, that collapse and expand. Um, Sam was just showing this list of items um, and how you can search uh, on a provider that will be applied soon in a couple of these other places. Um, but actually the most difficult uh, accordion piece was uh, that we have, this is an infinitely scrolling list, uh, sort of infinitely scrolling. Um, it, it is a list that when you scroll loads in more records. Um, and so that was a little difficult to achieve with an accordion, but we managed to do that. Um, so as part of these kind of design changes, uh, we want to make sure that we're also fitting this layout into a, a system that works well for um, all types of users. Um, so uh, one of the key parts of that is uh, a standard accessibility guideline uh, is to keep lines of text uh, under 100 characters or so uh, when you have blocks of text. Um, so none of this is actually a block of text uh, like that guideline specifically talks about, um, but we wanted to, to keep record uh, details and forms in a manageable state uh, that wasn't getting too wide. Um, so we started to apply maximum widths to some of these things. Um, so you can't really tell very much in a three pane layout like this because um, this content is kind of naturally at a, at a good size for what we need. Um, but if we look at one that is uh, all by itself, then we see this is, this is quite different. Um, this is now uh, much narrower. Um, it is much more uh, kind of, it's, it's easier to parse than if you're talking about a full width of the screen. Um, and that, that works well for the layouts that we're using here. Um, for individual records. And then if we look at a form, um, 
Let's actually add that to holdings so we can see the, the form. So if we were looking at a form, this is now a much more parsable form than if it were off to the left and these and take up a full width. Um, so that's kind of a, a standard that we're gonna encourage in some other places. Um, and that this is, if it does happen to be a block of text in, the, in this uh, pattern, um, then it will be under that kind of 100 character limit uh, for how, how parsable and readable it is. Um, so other pieces of this that are interesting are uh, looking at uh, this particular section. Actually, let's look at a title. Um, that's where it gets really interesting because there's a lot more information. Um, so the, um, if we look at this in kind of a, a responsive format, um, here we have two columns at this size. Um, but if we're looking at this in a, in a much narrower size, um, we'll see that it pops down to being a single column. Um, because if we were looking at it in two columns of this size, that would be really, really difficult to parse. Um, basically, some of these long uh, titles and publisher names would, wouldn't really fit very well. Um, so that, at a small size, is single column, expands to a double column, uh, two columns, I should say. Um, so one of the interesting things about this is we did not use um, the React Flexbox grid component um, that, that a lot of the other uh, Foley modules are using to lay out their forms. And the reason is because React Flexbox uh, grid responds to the width of the window. Um, so uh, instead of the width of its container. So this, these two columns here are responding to the width of the pane itself. Um, so you can see now they switch down to a single column instead of the width of the whole window like the, the other grids do. Um, so that was kind of a, a key innovation that we, we hope to be able to share in some other places. The code is actually really simple, um, so it should be very available uh, uh, people very soon. That's all I've got. Cool. And uh, last but not least, Taras. Okay, my turn. Okay, so what I'll show you is the, uh, oh, sorry, what am I doing here? Ah, ah, there. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, you guys saw all of my screens. Um, so what I wanna show you is the work that I did on the date picker. So this was, uh, this was an effort that I did with, uh, with John and with uh, Jeffrey. Part of the challenge here is that so uh, what we started with was a date picker component that's used, it, it's in Stripes Connect, uh, and it's used in, uh, on, in every app. Um, but we didn't really have, like we had all the code written, but we didn't have any, there was, it, it, there was no place where it was written down what that component should do or what it's expected to do and, and how it's expected to work. And so the first step was trying to gather all the requirements. Um, and so with, where, where, it was, where it was going, like what the intention of this was to understand what the comp what this component does, then create a test suite that would allow us to uh, to kind of um, verify that the the features that are supported by the component actually work as as they expect, and if we change something, that they will continue to work as they expect uh, as we expect. So the first step was gathering all of the. Um, uh, all the expectations, uh, and John was really helpful with this. Um, and so the, and then I described essentially all the different ways that this component could be used, and went ahead and implemented the, like wrote the tests. Um, so if you notice here in a screenshot, there are, um, there are numbers, basically some, they represent the percentages of test coverage. Uh, and I'm not showing the actual component itself, but I, I will show a demo uh, in a second, so you'll have you have an idea of what it is that um, I'm referring to here. But so these numbers represent how much of the component has been tested, and so there are certain features of this component that I did not test because there is not like we 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 there was kind of agreement through conversations with people that some of the, some of the things that the component does currently should not be implemented or should not be there. So we didn't I didn't test everything. But for features that the component is expected to support, I um, I added added the tests. So now the challenge, like one of the one of the one of the things that happens when you start to do this kind of testing is that first you identify there's actually things that didn't work uh, as expected. So there's a few props, there's a few behaviors. For example, like if you want to specify disabled, you want to put the date picker into disabled mode. 
like those that didn't work. Um, read only worked kind of strangely. So I had to fix a few things as, as I was going along. But I also found in a process of doing this work, I also found some, some things that were really, that were really strange. And I think they require um, kind of a more collective uh, discussion as to how it's supposed to work. So I'll show you that now. So this is a problem with, uh, so you will see, so what I'll show here is uh, it's a, uh, a video recording of the of interacting. Uh, this video I included in the issue that describes this problem. Essentially what you will see is that when the user is interacting with the input field, we, we're going to see a, um, the date picker, but interacting with the date picker causes strange interactions with the input field. And so in itself, when you're looking at here, like, so I'll show you this first. So notice how, like now I'm going to navigate like with the cursor, like so I'm using the keys to move the selection. So the idea here is that the user should be able to select, um, uh, select a date using keyboard and mouse. And so what I'm do, so what I'm showing here is, as you navigate, uh, what's happening is that the the position of the cursor in the date picker. Uh, in, this, in, in this container is uh, changing, but also if you notice, if you look in the input field, the position of the cursor in the input field is changing as well. So this was, this was kind of um, this was kind of the first step that that made me realize that there might be a bigger problem here with the way this component is implemented. Uh, is it clear uh, what I'm trying to demo here? Or do you have, is there, are there any questions? Okay, I'll assume that it's clear. It's clear. Okay, and so I'll show you what actually happens. So when you activate the screen reader, so what happens here is that um, when we interact with the, uh, when we're using the screen reader, it creates a really strange behavior because, uh, so I'll show you what it looks like with screen reader on. Voiceover on QuickTime player, screen selector, window, screen save, Safari, game edit text. You are currently on up zero slash two twelve slash two zero one eight two thousand eighteen eight one zero two two zero one eight. So there's a few things that are really strange here. One is that the uh, so when when the date picker is open, the um, the user who is using the, the screen reader doesn't really know anything about the date picker. But then what happens is as you interact with the input fields, it's navigating in the input field, but it's not really, um, it's not really conveying, like it, there is a, a bit of a disconnect here between uh, the intention, because if, if the input, the, uh, if the date picker is open, uh, there, we might need to have different focus so that the focus is in the date picker. So the user can select from the date picker. And one of the um, other accessibility requirements is like the, the kind of a best practice for accessibility of date pickers is that using the, um, the date picker, the actual calendar itself should be optional. But what happens right now is that it's, it's kind of optional, but it always opens. So there is some, like there is some work to be done here and these kind of problems got flushed out as I was working on tests. So, one of the things that's going to be coming up uh, in the near future is revisiting this calendar, uh, the state picker, and figuring out exactly what are we, what is our intention uh, for how this should be used for, uh, with with screen readers. And now that we have tests, we can change the implementation of the of the date picker in a way that will continue to work. Like we'll have a way to verify that things are that things are still still working um, while making changes to the component. So that's what, um, so, the, so it, you know, we have, a, as a result, we have 80% test coverage on this component. Um, and um, we, we have this issue that we, we, need, to, we need to discuss um, and figure out exactly how, to, how it should be addressed. So that's everything from my demo. Okay, thanks. Um, so I think we're gonna have to move a little bit faster. Uh, I just realized what time it is. I think we have 25 more minutes. 
Um, so next we have EBSCO. And uh, uh, do you want to, I, I think some of this is on slides. Uh, so will you be showing the slides, I guess? Yes, we'll start with the slides and uh, okay. we'll be switching between different people presenting. Okay, go right ahead then. All right. Hello everyone, this is not Mark Wexler speaking. It's Magda Zaharska. <laughs> Hi Mag. <laughs> we, um, in this iteration, we move our tests to the public repository, our API tests uh, to public uh, repos repository and are available for everyone to use. In EBSCO, we use those tests to, as a part of our backend models pipeline to verify the deployment of the module. We run those tests uh, on each commit to the um, GitHub repository for backend modules. At this point, we have 17 modules covered by the tests. Um, the main, there are several uh, reasons we run those tests. Uh, we um, wanted to stabilize our environment. That's why we started writing them. They also help finding bugs. Um, so far, we identified about more than 100 uh, bugs. Some of them were addre addressed already. And um, the tests are also notifying us about the changes that are occurring in the, um, in the code, uh, bug fixes, uh, new functionality, schema changes, etc. cetera. Uh, those tests, of course, don't need to be only run within the pipeline. They can be run on the local uh, machine of the developer. And this is what I'm going to um, present uh, right now. I will run the tests that Matt Reno from our group wrote for uh, module login. And I will execute those tests against the um, folio test backend. Let me share my screen. Oh, here we go. So um, it takes just 17 seconds from the time. the summary of the test uh, they run in 15 seconds, we find uh, some issues. The issues are related to the changes in the response for the, uh, when the uh, response has status uh, for three and for one. Um, as a spoiler alert, those issues has al have already been addressed by our team uh, and one the back end um, will be updated to the newest version of Okapi and uh, mod module logins, this issue will be resolved. That's it. Thank you. All right. Coming right along. Hi everybody, this is Eric Deluc. Um, I'm presenting some work that we've done for the Nightmare uh, Stripe CLI testing. Um, we identified the need to produce coverage information from uh, Nightmare testing. So we added a uh, dash dash coverage option to the Stripe CLI. Um, it's a fairly long process and just, you know, whatever a developer would see normally. So I just skipped to showing you the uh, start and then the results uh, in the next couple slides. Um, developers can get immediate feedback on their tests that they've created. 
Um, and it's a very simple execution, which you can see an example up on the slide there. Uh, just in the right corner, you can see the dash dash covered option. Uh, when it's done, it produces a uh, console output that's a summary of the test that just ran. Uh, you can see at the very top, there's um, code coverage information. Uh, this was just one um, module, one set of tests from one module that uh, produced that value. Uh, it's, uh, it aggregates all the tests that are run and prints out the, the summary at the end. Um, the, uh, the utility also prints out an interactive, or produces an interactive HTML a document that can be viewed, viewed um, afterwards. And uh, all of these are links that you can go and visit and see what code was covered and how much of the percentage each portion has. Uh, and as a final um, data point, it also provides uh, Sonar Cube compatible output, so it can be uploaded uh, to automated testing tools. Hi, uh, this is Varun. So uh, we have expanded suite by implementing JMeter scripts for mod circulation module. So up until now, we have contributed 24 JMeter scripts, which are triggering around 16,000 HTTP requests through nightly Jenkins job. These HTTP requests are running against 3 million records and uh, PostgreSQL database. So after investigating performance for mod circulation, we have found that HTTP requests made from mod circulation to mod inventory storage take up the majority of elapsed time or latency. APIs that are uh, creating a bottleneck are item storage, holding storage, material type, and location. So another observation uh, is there's a dependency among these APIs. So for example, when creating a new loan, dependency between item storage uh, followed by like items, material type view followed by holdings, then instance, which is again followed by location, uh, which is again followed by material type API. So in all, they end up taking around 15 to 16 seconds to create one loan. So to fix this issue, there's a proposal put forward to deprecate items material type view which is taking majority of elapsed time so this is still a work in progress so following jira tickets have been raised as as part of this performance issue thank you yep hi uh, this is martin trent uh, i am uh, going to provide an update on the uh, folio uh, EBSCO uh, um, uh, follow, uh, integration into um, EBSCO discovery service. Um, so I am sharing my screen. So um, over the, the last couple of demos, uh, we showed um, the patron uh, account uh, in EDS. Um, we showed the, the uh, number of checkouts that the patron has and the um, renew functionality. And today I'm going to um, talk briefly about uh, the um, patron account view of the fees and fines. Um, so um, I'm going to log into uh, um, PDS. And uh, as you can see up here, uh, we have, uh, for this patron, uh, we have 10 uh, checkouts and uh, three fees. And uh, when going to the fees folder, we will see the fees listed. Um, along with their reason, uh, their status, um, the date incurred, and the amount due. Uh, we have some sample data added. Um, so um, you know, these are not real um, data, but uh, you, you can see that the, the amount due um, add up to the total amount up here. So that's, that's it. Hello, this is Craig uh, at EBSCO. Uh, today, uh, I don't have anything to demo, but I'll be presenting some of the work that we've uh, done to an degree, um, Goby with Folio. Um, so 
As you can see, the green boxes here indicate that there are two new components um, contributed to Folio. Uh, that's an Edge API called Edge Orders and a backend business logic module called ModGobi that has um, business logic specific to integrating with uh, Gobi order placement. Um, so the Edge API works just like all the other uh, Edge APIs that we've presented so far, and it works based on an institutional user. Um, and so far what we have in place is um, you know, we're able to place an order in Gobi. It goes through the Edge API, uh, makes it to mod Gobi, and then from there we're just mocking all those behind the scenes interactions because um, you know that work hasn't been um, fully fleshed out yet. Um, so right now we're just returning a mock um, PO line number. But we're able from uh, the Gobi side of things to see that the order was placed as far as it knows. Um, you know, full, you know the order is inside the folio system, um, and all is good. So eventually, obviously, we need to. Um, implement the back end logic um, and, and finish the integration on that side. Thanks. Uh, hello, uh, this is Hong Wei and Tony from Ibisco. I will share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so uh, in this sprint, we worked on the audit and, and analytics related work. The first step is to extract data from Folio. There are different ways to do that. What we did is to leverage the Okapi filter mechanisms. As seen on this diagram, uh, within this uh, Okapi orange box, uh, you have the green box, those are filters. And then you have the blue box, that's the module handlers. Both filters and uh, handlers can be implemented by modules outside of Okapi. So um, before this work, there, uh, a typical uh, flow only involves a uh, OS filter and the handler, that's it. And with this work, uh, Okapi introduced the pre and post filters. And those filters are implemented by uh, audit modules. And from this audit modules, uh, we capture all the request and response from Folio and uh, forward that to an external system, for example, RabbitMQ or Apache and Kafka. Uh, so now I will give a quick demo to, say, to show how it works. So on this screen, uh, you will see the, a simple open source UI for the Kafka queue. It says, okay, right now there are 806 messages. So if I go to uh, our dev instance of Folio, if I log in, this action should trigger some uh, message got flowing into the system. So let's see the number changes become 860. So if you do a query here, click the view the message. Okay, it's come back. Uh, it's an open source UI, so it's kind of slow. So you, you, <laughs> <laughs> so you, you see all the message on the all request uh, got logged in here, and uh, depends on uh, it's a preface or post phase, it's uh, separated. So in this post phase, you can see there's some uh, payload come back and all the HTTP request uh, headers. Uh, that's it for us. Thank you. This was it. Yeah. Go. I'll look back to you. She's muted. Holly, you're still muted. Holly, you're muted. Thanks for reminding me. Okay, let's move on to at cult. Um, we have Tiziana that's going to do a, a demo for at cult. Good afternoon. Okay, I go to share my screen. Yeah. 
Okay, I will show you briefly where we are. As you know, we are working uh, in porting uh, the search function uh, in MacCat as MacCat, and uh, differently from the previous uh, um, a demo, uh, we refactored uh, the the user interface. Uh, following uh, the specification uh, of Folio. So now we are, uh, we hope, perfectly standard with the Folio um, architecture and the user interface uh, um, expectation. So I can show you again uh, the advanced search, uh, in this case uh, uh, using Folio user interface. And uh, as Christian uh, expressed you demo you in the last uh, sprint we implemented all the uh, indexes that we have available to query a mark uh, 21 record and we split in the primary and secondary for the complexity of uh, uh, these indexes we have more or less more than uh, uh, 400 indexes that we can combine with the Boolean operator such as and, near, not, and or. So we choose uh, for a solution to uh, present in a correct way the complexity of the search uh, criteria. So we can choose, uh, for example, uh, for uh, a, a title and for a proper title, such as something like uh, uh, Harry Potter, and we can combine with the Boolean operator, for example, a secondary index, uh, something related to physical item and contents, such as uh, bibliographic level, for example, and so I search for a monograph, and I search. I uh, don't uh, see the performance because uh, the system is uh, in a, in a test environment, but we have now the answer for the query and what we are doing is the presentation of this file, the presentation of the search result, because now we receive an XML file and we need change and present in a, a, in a table for more than one result or directly mark format for one result. So this is actually our work uh, to present the, the correct uh, answer. But the, the search was completed and all indexes were implemented. And we can also, uh, I can show you the, um, uh, the, the most important for us uh, uh, task that is uh, the template because uh, for us the template is uh, the heart of the system. So when we will finish the template, I hope at the end of August, we will have uh, half uh, of our cataloging system. So we can have uh, a template uh, and we can select uh, an existent template uh, or we can uh, uh, create uh, a new template. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh. Okay, so we can create a new template. And uh, so for this reason, I mentioned that this is the heart of the system because you can here choose, for example, for a new tag, for example, for a name, and you can define a subfield as an example and to define as your template and so on. So when, uh, okay. So now the new tag uh, is, uh, is uh, present and um, uh, to, you can also delete and, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes. You can also delete uh, a template and uh, click or edit uh, a new one. So here you can see the message for template and so on. Oops. I'm sorry. 
Okay. And uh, the last one is uh, diacritics and uh, indexes. Uh, we are working on this function that is cross for us because uh, we need the uh, make possible to select uh, to search uh, and uh, to select uh, a diacritic, uh, so a special character, uh, both in the advanced search and in cataloging. So we finished with uh, this uh, function and now we need to integrate uh, in uh, advanced search and uh, in uh, cataloging and the same and in cataloging yes and the same is uh, for indexes that is the list of all indexes available to be used in advanced search uh, okay okay so i think that uh, it's enough for today okay thank, thank you. you very much Okay, so next up we have Quilto, and I'm sorry if I'm saying this wrong, it's, it's, is it Mate? No. Yes. Okay. Okay, so, uh, let, me, let me share my screen. Uh, cool. Uh, can you see this? Yes. Cool. Uh, so, uh, we focused on the calendar settings uh, page. Um, uh, here, uh, when we click the service point, uh, uh, it will mm, give you a list of service points. And uh, uh, if you click it, uh, there will be mm, the details of this uh, CRC desk one uh, description and uh, we can uh, create a new opening period by clicking this and uh, for create a period you just need to choose uh, the prompt to uh, the name and uh, here uh, in this calendar uh, we can uh, select the intervals like uh, from Sunday 2 p.m. to 2 a.m. to 10 a.m. Uh, it will be op uh, the library will be open or if we click uh, up here uh, it means uh, that uh, mon in a Monday uh, it's open uh, the library open all day uh, if we uh, leave a like Tuesday, we leave it blank. It it will it means uh, that uh, the library is closed at Tuesday. Uh, yes, uh, when, uh, we can uh, we can select uh, uh, multiple uh, intervals in one day, and uh, we can uh, drag and drop the intervals uh, to a different day mm, and. Uh, we can resize these intervals uh, and if we are done, just click to save and uh, here uh, uh, we can see this uh, current uh, test period uh, and its details here. Uh, if we create another one, uh, 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 it uh, validates the overlapping, so you cannot create a uh, from uh, a so overlapping uh, periods. Uh, yes, so just create one, uh, and uh, you can see uh, if, uh, the next periods. Uh, what we did. Uh, I think um, that's all. That looks great. Thank you. Um, we're going to do one more demo since we're out of time. And then uh, Jakob is going to uh, pass his slides to me and I'll send them out to everybody, uh, the platform update. So we're going to do one more. Uh, Folijet, is that, I think that's how you say it. Say Victor. it. Victor. Uh, yeah, hi. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. I'm trying to share my screen. Yep. Do you see it? 
<clears throat> yes, we can see it. Thanks. So uh, we have several things uh, to show you. As a part of uh, our uh, several sprints, yeah, we developed uh, a new uh, settings type module, my profile. And as a part of this module, we added uh, change password page. And uh, you can see it here. And uh, just uh, to show you um, at the start of this, that uh, uh, another feature that we added is to have the link to that change password page from the user dropdown. And uh, that required to work in uh, another, you know, uh, Stripe score package. So that's why it was, uh, you know, uh, its own story for that feature. And uh, now we can see the actual form. We added uh, standard validation for uh, the forms, like many Stripe components uh, have. And uh, uh, just with, uh, by type something, now we see that we have save button and if we try to navigate away, we have the standard uh, uh, model yeah, that say, say uh, us that we have unsaved data. And now let's try to see uh, if uh, the, 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 the another uh, validations which we have, for example, uh, I. I'm going to put uh, the wrong password, which I don't, uh, which is wrong, uh, and to change it uh, uh, to another one. Uh, and while doing that, you uh, also see that we have another validation uh, that about uh, which says that new and confirm uh, password uh, should uh, match, and uh, we uh, can't actually submit the form until we uh, pass it validation. So let's make the uh, that fields the same. And now we see that uh, we have uh, we get rid of the uh, validation error. And now let's try uh, another feature which I want to show is show hide password feature. It is about just to show in hiding uh, entire fields. And uh, yeah, and let's try to submit it. Seems like seems like something goes wrong with the latest snapshot because I checked it before the demo that it uh, was not working uh, at some time. Okay, let's try to. In the meantime, let's try to uh, open it on the, ah, okay, let's go to our page. Password. Okay. Let's try to, yeah, and you see that uh, now we have the server call and uh, it says that uh, our current password is incorrect and we should enter uh, a correct password in order to change our, uh, our um, password to the new one. Now we have admin, it's this correct password and let's try it again. And now we see that we have the notification message about that we successfully changed the password. And uh, in that case, we just reset the form. Let's, uh, let's check uh, that our uh, new password is working. So I have for legit, we have for legit user and let's uh, enter ad admin one new password. And you see that we successfully logged in. Uh, that's actually it. Uh, one uh, one note which I want to add here is that uh, we have uh, uh, a restriction, you know, to show that uh, uh, that page, the chain password page, only if uh, we logged in uh, via a uh, local password and not uh, via SSO. We check that uh, uh, data from the uh, a copy and 
from the stripes object uh, in our components. And uh, if we had uh, uh, the SSO again, in that case, we don't show uh, that link and the component uh, here. And that's me, thank you. Great. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thanks to everyone who did a demo today. We really appreciate it. And um, like I said, we'll be sending out um, sending out Jakob's uh, slides. Uh, and then um, this is all the EBSCO. The EBSCO slides are here. Uh, let's see here. And then we have, uh, okay. And then uh, we started Sprint 44 yesterday. Um, so our next Sprint review will be the first Tuesday in September. And then we have some slides that outline what's coming up for the Sprint, which you can look at uh, in, at your leisure when I send out the, the Sprint deck. Um, so that's it for now. Does anybody have any lingering questions? Okay, so thanks everybody. Uh, thanks to the people who demoed. It was very interesting. Uh, a lot of new things happening. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Holly. Thank you, Holly. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank Have a good rest both. of the day. Thanks, Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.